Well, I am Ken White, and I do approve of that message. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the Caterpillar Club, uh, it's a rather unique club. You, you probably know, read a little bit in that flyer that we put out. Uh, basically, paratroopers, do we have any here, by the way? Any paratroopers? Well, paratroopers are quite different. They jump out of airplanes for a living. Uh, Caterpillar Club members jump out of an airplane just to keep on living. <laughs> and that's, that's the major difference between the two. Uh, paratroopers, of course, uh, I have a bunny of mine, a uh, school chum, actually, too tall for the Air Force and that, that eyesight, so he became a paratrooper. And he did quite a few jumps. Oddly enough, he'd never landed in an airplane until his last jump, the weather got so bad they couldn't do the jump. So uh, they came in and landed and scared the heck out of him. <laughs> he'd never seen buildings going by, just the water wingtip, and then he was on the wrong way at Wingley Airport in Manchester. Uh, the uh, Air Force, uh, people who dropped paratroopers, uh, we'd use the C-47, the Dakota, and it was quite a normal aircraft, and very easy to get in and out of. Uh, the uh, Air Force uh, air crew, uh, after the war, they were still uh, dropping paratroopers for practice, and the air crew then had to do their parachute jump training as well. Uh, they didn't do any actual hard jumps because they're fairly expensive to retrain an air pilot if he screws it up. So uh, they have a, a, a device which uh, I saw the hangar where they were doing it. I landed there one day uh, on this base because the weather was bad. I was on. Uh, transports at the time at the group headquarters and get in there and they have a, a in the hangar it's about the same size as ours or the one on the other side of the field and they have two little fan blades about that square and they, they're tied to a little pulley and they put that belt on and the guy's tied to this and uh, as a result of that uh, he jumps off the roof of the hangar and there's about a six inch mattress at the bottom where you're supposed to land. And that thing speeds up and that controls the rate of descent. And it's about the same as you get when you jump out of a balloon. And balloon jumping uh, for paratroops is usually the one they're not that keen on doing. Because you've got no forward speed at all. When you jump from an aircraft, you're going at the same speed as the aircraft. Uh, if you jump from the, uh, the balloon, you're dropping until that chute extends and the air fills it up. It takes about two seconds for the chute to get out. But uh, that's a long way down while you're looking at it before everything sort of pops up and you're on the way. So that's basically what we're going on there. Now, the parachute club, to be able to get into it, or the Caterpillar Club, there's a the requirement is that you have to get out of an aircraft in any sort of emergency. It doesn't matter if the thing's on fire or wing falls off in the early 20s and 30s, that was not an uncommon occasion, uh, unfortunately. So uh, the, uh, it has to be verified by other people. Uh, the, that's why paratroopers don't get into it, that's their normal duty. So anybody who does jump, uh, it has to be verified either by a CEO or by some witnesses who saw it happen, or some other members of the crew. And in my case, I'll get to that one later on. So. Not everybody, unfortunately, has a parachute when they get out. I can put three cases on that. One American and two Brits. Uh, the first American was, uh, I belonged to a group called the B-17 Combat Crewmen and Wingmen. And one of our, two of our members there were parachute club members, Caterpillar Club members. And <coughs> one, if I can just take a little moment to get his name correct, because some of these that I'll be talking about are quite odd, but this one fairly simple. Uh, Staff Sergeant Alan McGee. He was a, a B-17 uh, gunner from the C 360th Bomb Squadron, the 303rd Bomb Group, and it, his aircraft was the Snap, Crackle, and Pop. It's one thing with the Americans, they had some pretty neat slogans on the side of the aircraft. We never bothered with that and bomber come out. We were flying at night and nobody saw it anyway. So <laughs> sort of a, a lot of pain, but wasted for nothing. But they, anyway, uh, they'd been on a raid on San Nazir which was a famous port on the French coast, uh, big submarines, pens there, and they were bombed pretty heavily throughout the whole war. Uh, they were on that raid, and they got, uh, four of the aircraft were shot down, which was quite a lot in those days. Uh, this was going back to uh, 1943, in uh, January the 3rd, to be exact. Anyway, uh, he got blown out of the aircraft. Uh, some of the crew stayed with it, unfortunately, and they were killed. Uh, he came whistling on down without a parachute from 20,000 feet. 
it doesn't take you long to get to the ground in a case like that mm. because you're uh, dropping at about 120 miles an hour, uh, which is about 107, 170 feet per second. So it doesn't take you long to get there. So he was sort of uh, praying that he might make it and uh, still had a lot of life left to go. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it was not his choice at that time. What happened was he came crashing through the glass roof of the railway station at San Azir, and that broke his fall. And, and he survived it. They got to him and rushed him off to first aid, then he finished up in a hospital. It was a German doctor saved his arm, and he never did find out who that particular guy, uh, doctor was, so uh, he went back there uh, about 50 years later with his wife. He'd been invited back by the French. Uh, they were having a memorial service, and they just finished a statue, a, a memorial, uh, graveyard section for the remainder of his crew. So he was invited to go along to that, which was a kind of an impressive setup indeed. So um, he never did, as I mentioned, never did find out who the German was, but he was treated like visiting royalty. And if you ever go to Europe and visit some of these uh, cemeteries over there, they're meticulously maintained by either the French, the Germans, uh, sorry, or the uh, Belgians and Dutch, where many of the American airmen were buried. In fact, an awful lot of them. Uh, everybody looks upon the survivors like myself as heroes. The heroes were still in Germany. And in the case of the RAF, 55,731 buried somewhere in Germany. 20,000 of them were never found. So uh, we had quite a loss, big heavy loss rate, as did the 8th Air Force. I'm not forgetting that the, four, the 15th Air Force, as they started bombing Germany from the south once we captured Italy. But in that particular area, uh, if you do go over there, do visit them, and they're being very well maintained and highly respected by the local natives. Some of them adopt various graves and take care of the individual graves themselves. Anyway, the second one was an RAF guy. Uh, he was uh, quite famous for several reasons, actually. He was a tail gunner in the Lancaster, and the, I'll show this later on, but the, the Lancaster was a very difficult aircraft to bail out of. Well, the Halifax that I flew in was quite easy to get out of. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you'll see that later as to how we did it. But in the Lancaster, uh, the bomb aimer up front and the tail gunner down at the back end, they had the best chance of surviving. And the layout in the Lank was such that then the, two, the pilot, we only carried one pilot and, one and uh, no second pilot. Side by side with him was the flight engineer. And behind them was a navigator, and then the wireless operator, then the mid-upper turret gunner, then way down at the back end, the tail gun. There were two exits, one in the nose and one at the back end where he got in and out of the aircraft. But the tail gun was very easy because he could rotate his turret 90 degrees, open the doors, and just fall out. Before he did that, of course, he'd better put on the parachute because he <laughs> didn't have room for it inside the uh, turret, as you'll see when I show you some pictures of it. Uh, anyway, on this particular occasion, they got hit. Uh, they'd been on the Berlin Raid, they were on the way back, and they got nailed by a night fighter over uh, uh, Cologne, a, a big one, uh, in the Ruhr. Anyway, they had to bail out. The aircraft was on fire, and uh, he got the order to jump. They acknowledged that. He turned his turret dead aft, opened the doors behind him to get his parachute, which is inside, mounted on the right-hand side of the aircraft. And of course, the whole length of the fuse line was a wall of flame, and he could see his parachute was already on fire, so he shut the doors around and sit inside and cook and fry to death. He decided he'd uh, get out. By this time, uh, <clears throat> he'd taken off his oxygen room mask, and of course the oxygen room kept coming through anyway from the bottle in the back end, uh, and uh, that caused the flames and everything inside. The soup was burning as well, and so was he. He got his face charred quite badly. There's a manual operation in all these rear turrets. You do wind the handle, and the turret can turn it left or right. So he turned it 90 degrees, and rather than stay in the aircraft and uh, cook to death, he thought, well, this be at least quick if he goes out. So how he went. And he remembers falling quite uh, fully conscious. And as he came down, he was sort of falling head first. And all he can remember was he could see all the stars between his feet. He lost his boots uh, when he was getting up. He got trapped and he had to fight his way out and they had stayed in the aircraft. Uh, so down he came and the next thing he remembers, he's still looking at the stars, but they're surrounded by branches from a tree. And he, what had happened, he landed in a, a fir tree and a, also about two feet of snow there. And it was the only snow, the field was completely dry. If he'd missed by 20 feet, 
it had been dead, but he landed in this tree and came down uh, and in one piece. He was quite surprised he was in one piece. Uh, and he had been unconscious for about three hours after the fall. It, it, nothing, it's when he came to that all this came back to him. His name was uh, Nicholas Alcamandi. And what had happened is uh, when you jump on an RAF aircraft, your chute is clipped in. There's two buckles on the chute, as you'll see later. They clip into two clips that are a part of your harness. And our harness, I think I'll quickly get to this if I may here. That's our release buckle in the British unit. It's, uh, you can see here, we've got four, uh, your four straps here. The two go to your shoulders, and the other two go to your legs. So to turn that, you just turn it clockwise 90 degrees. It's spring-loaded, you hit it with a whack, and these four things fall out. Well, when you fly, uh, that's not showing in this particular shot, but I'll get back to that later. And leave that one up there. That's my badge. This is the guy who designed the chute to save our lives. Over 120,000 in World War II alone. But I'll come on to that in just a moment. Anyway, coming back to our guys that uh, came, this guy came down without the chute. Uh, <clears throat> when he got up, he was feeling a bit wobbly and he started to walk. He found that his right leg was a bit stiff from the packing he'd taken when he got out of the aircraft. And so he, didn't, he was in German territory, obviously. So not much else to do except we used to carry a dinghy whistle on our little uh, jacket on our tunics and he blew that quite a bit till he got some action and three German home guard type soldiers came along and the first thing that he sat down and had a cigarette the first thing they did was steal his cigarettes they were hard to find <laughs> so, uh, they took him into the uh, local uh, police station then along came the Gestapo and picked him up and they wanted to know where he put his parachute because they could, it wasn't there when they picked him up. Uh, and they said, well, he jumped without it. Of course, they didn't believe him. And they started threatening him with, well, you're a spy, obviously, and uh, they got you. And they said, go back and find out. I uh, told you where they found me. Go back and find out for yourself. So they went back there and found his harness. And they suddenly realized the guy had been telling the truth. So uh, <clears throat> what happened? Also in our harness, uh, it's one thing that's inside like that. And then to make sure it stays there all the time, there's a little cord that goes over it, just in order to get a string. And that was still there. So it was obvious the chute had not been used in the normal manner. So uh, they kept that. And then they whizzed him off to a prison camp. And by this time, he was a bit of a celebrity. And, uh, and when they got to the prison camp, there they had uh, an, a British officer and two other NCOs certified that he had come down without a chute. They got all the prisoners together and they gave a story as to how that all happened. So he's practically a local hero. What was interesting after the war, when the war was over and he came back and then applied for his caterpillar, uh, which he couldn't get one because he hadn't used a shoe. So <laughs> 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 they, they were pretty strict on that. So, uh, his subsequent uh, life was uh, rather interesting indeed. He got a job uh, working for a, a chemical uh, plant and uh, having survived that the first thing he got stumbled and fell into um, he was working in a, a pit uh, with the some fluid that was creating chlorine gas and uh, <clears throat> the tool that he was working with shorted out and knocked him back uh, with a shock and it knocked his mask off he fell into this thing and he was yelling for help it took him about 15 minutes before somebody found him dragged him out, otherwise he could have died from uh, poison gas poison, uh, from the, the chlorine gas poison. So that was number one. That was the second one he had. His third one was the, uh, he'd been working, uh, <coughs> siphoning out some uh, acids out of this uh, tank, and the, uh, one of the pipes burst, and it sprayed his face and arms with acid. Fortunately, there was a ba barrel of lime there, and he dived into that. And that saved him and came out with only light first degree burns on his face and arms. And his third one that he'd been working away from the, a nine foot tall steel door fell on him and <laughs> flattened him down. And everybody thought he was dead underneath the weight of this thing. They picked him up and he was quite okay with a few bruises. He got the message after three near calls like that, he changed 
I went into selling furniture. So <laughs> <laughs> I think after four items like that, he was running out of time, and his guardian angel was getting a bit tired. <laughs> and then the third one was on a raid we sent. Uh, we have the Lockheed Lodestar out here on the flight line. Uh, that was derived from the Lockheed Hudson, which became the Lockheed Ventura. They were designed by Kelly Johnson for the Royal Air Force. This was before America was in the war, and we had a, a British company, a British purchasing committee, rather, uh, from the service uh, of services buying stuff up as much munitions as they could get. And Kelly Johnson designed the aircraft over a weekend, and they built a complete wooden carver model of the Lockheed Hudson. It was derived basically from the Lockheed Electro, which was famous for the Amelia aircraft flights. Uh, anyway, uh, that became the, the Hudson, and the Ventura was a bigger version. In the bigger version with bigger engines and a bit more armament on it. Carried a crew of four, the pilot, the navigator who did the bombing and it was more rather like I did, and two gunners, one on the top turret, which was halfway back, a very round bubble type turret, and then they had a ventral turret at the back end underneath. Uh, they sent 11 of these aircraft to bomb the uh, Amsterdam uh, factory there. It was on, uh, they were building electronic stuff. Out of the 11 aircraft, uh, 10 were shot down. Uh, one got shot up so badly it, it had to turn back before it even got to the uh, Dutch coast. So it was a very expensive raid. Uh, this particular gunner was on the uh, ventral turret at the back end. Two people got out alive on that one. Uh, the navigator got out at the front end, but he had a parachute. Unfortunately, he wasn't wearing it. He was carrying it. The plane was completely on fire, and uh, he didn't want to go out through the top because he felt he'd hit the turret. So he made it to the front entry hatch and got out that way. The pilot and the other the gunner was killed. The gunner, the top turret gunner was killed right away. Anyway, the, the fellow was going out on the underside. Uh, it, the, his chute was on fire as well. So he got as far back in the aircraft as he could, hun hunkered down on the floor with his back to all the tail end. Now this is a twin, a, a twin rudder at the back end and just the tail plate on the top of the fuselage exactly the same as the one we have there. So all he could see was the flame gradually burning stuff away, and he started seeing the riveting and the fuselage beginning to melt in front of him. And he kept going back, and of course he couldn't go any further back, so he just sat there. There was a bloody great bang, and the aircraft blew up. And what happened was quite amazing, because he, as he sat there, the whole front of the aircraft disappeared, and he's sitting in the tail. <laughs> and this thing came down from 8,000 feet when it happened. He, uh, the, the thing came apart at about 6,000, as you've seen the altimeter when he, as he was going back there. And he just sort of sat there. Now, it didn't sort of come down like this. It came down in a, a spiral all the way down. And to him, it was very quite right. Uh, no sensation of much speed at all. But he didn't realize he was coming down pretty damn fast. And <laughs> as it came down, you could see land alone as it came swooping on and on, and then all of a sudden he thought, I'm going to hit something, and saw that he hit, which he did. He landed in the backyard of someone's house and got away, but stepped up. No, again, no parachute badge for him, no caterpillar, because he hadn't used a shoe. And his survival was quite remarkable because he finished up as a POW for quite a few years. So that was basically the three that didn't have a shoot and couldn't join up. Now, coming back now to what you to start, why we have parachutes. And that's the, you got three things when you become a member of the Caterpillar Club. You get your little card like this, which I've got in my wallet here, uh, which annoys my curator here that I shouldn't be walking around with that bit of history with me. Uh, I still have my Caterpillar, that's it right there, it's at home. And then, <clears throat> The other thing, you get one at each of these, and the other thing you get is continued life, which is the most important. <laughs> <laughs> this was the man responsible for it all, Leslie Irvin. You can Google him, and you'll find, when you get to that, you'll find there's two Leslie Irvins. The other one was a serial killer. Which <laughs> 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 I didn't even bother reading, but of course, kind of neat twist. Here's the guy saving lives, the other guy was uh, wiping people up. <laughs> anyway, uh, this young man, oh, he, this was a bit later, in, uh, when he was in his 50s probably, uh, when he was 12 years old, he was born in 1895, two centuries ago practically, um, 
he's always been fascinated with the, uh, in those days balloons. And I think somewhere we can just get me some idea. That's his evolution company. Uh, somewhere I thought I had some balloons. No, we'll get back to it. <coughs> Ballooning had uh, well, the parachute itself goes back 400 years. The first one, of course, was uh, Leonardo da Vinci. He drew one up. It was rather pyramid-like with four uh, cords from it. Never used it, but that was the first parachute design. By a couple of hundred years later, uh, two Frenchmen, or three Frenchmen, uh, designed some as well. And they were basically along the same lines. They were rigid devices, uh, not too effective. But people were getting the idea of balloons. And with hot air balloons, you can get the hot air filling up the big cavity and everything rises and you can float around all over the place, but you're very susceptible to wind direction. So by the early 1900s, ballooning, of course we had balloons in the Civil War for observation purposes, as we were using them in South Africa during the Boer War, again for observation purposes. And during that war, actually, uh, it's rather interesting, the, uh, we had observers in the air with a flying badge before we had pilots, because an airplane hadn't been invented yet. So uh, the old observer badger we used to have, which uh, and the RAF was used up until the beginning of the war, and they specialized and broke us all up into different categories with uh, navigators with uh, <coughs> radar, navigators with uh, bomb aimers, and navigators just doing plane navigation. So we had quite a array of badges that we could have. But the original one was an observer badge, it was affectionately known as a flying outshore. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we called it anyway, but uh, uh, not referring too many fellows. In fact, I slip into some of the jargon we had in the RAF, which is might sound risque, but it was, it was pretty genuine, quite humorous, humorous at the time. Anyway, by the time he was 12 years old, he was quite fascinated with ballooning. He'd seen a lot of it. It was uh, a common occurrence in LA. They had circuses. They had all these balloon people who go up there and jump up using a parachute from the balloon. Uh, <clears throat> that was quite a normal way of getting down in those days. Uh, that fascinated him. By the time he was 12, he got some ideas and got some buddies of his from school. And they built their own little hot air balloon and the basket with it. And to make it sort of more realistic, they got a little tabby cat, fitted it up with a little harness with a very clever mechanism, and they got the balloon fired up. It was too small an item for them to be able to fly in it, so up went the cat, and much to their uh, chagrin, it started drifting away with the wind, so they were chasing it through the streets of LA. And of course, it reached the coast, and off it went to sea, and the mechanism didn't work. So that little cat finished up somewhere, hopefully in Catalina, but probably not, uh, not that far off. Unfortunately, uh, he made a promise to himself at that age, uh, 12 years old, that the, He'd never test it, but let anyone test a balloon, a parachute without him testing it first. And he stayed with that throughout his life. And he did some 55 jumps. He came close to having to use his own chute once, but he was never a member of his own club. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, that was his first attempt at it. From then on, he went on to other things. I uh, wanted to, his family wanted to continue his education, but he was a bit of a free thinker and wanted to do his thing his own way. By the age of 16, he had joined a guy who was making uh, uh, race cars. Oh, sorry, I, mean, I came later, it was Barney Oldfield. He joined a fellow, I think I've got his name handy, if not, it doesn't matter. Uh, he was uh, into uh, building an aeroplane, and he helped him build it. And the plane actually flew over Los Angeles, which was pretty early on. This was into the, uh, after the Wright brothers, of course, by this time. So he got the bug then, because he wanted to get up in it, and uh, there was no seat. It was, no, it was a single engine, single engine and uh, one seat only, so that made his second pilot. He'd have to learn to fly, which he did, and became a very experienced pilot, and owned many airplanes throughout his life. So he got the bug. In the meantime, the Wright brothers had flown, and then up came World War I. And in World War I, uh, uh, the death rate among pilots, uh, Pilots were going into combat with probably about six to eight hours total flying time. So the average life of a pilot in World War II was about two months. So the chop rate was pretty damn high. Uh, balloons were being used in World War I uh, quite extensively for observation, both by the Brits and French and Germans. And the Brits have developed one called a Guardian Angel Parachute, 
which fitted on the side of the, the basket. I'm not getting any of it. Sorry. Anyway, uh, what happened, uh, <coughs> they were quite successful, but when they started shooting a lot of the balloon down, uh, balloons down, that was uh, a, a sort of warning cry that something had to be done. And there was no parachutes used in World War I by aircraft at all. The Germans in the latter end of the war were using a, a sort of effort at it because the parachutes in those days were packed in a canister and it was a, a gravity drop operation as the, the guy fell out of the balloon, it slowly pulled out of the, the basket that it was in and that the chute would open it and down he would come. Uh, basically the same cover, coverage that we have on the chutes that we were using in World War II. Anyway, the, uh, by the end of the war, the Brits, the Americans, and the French were not using chutes. The Germans had some uh, primitive version of it, and it worked surprisingly well, but they were again attached to the airplane, so it was not a free-fall chute uh, like we had later on. So during the war, uh, our friend uh, Leslie Irvin had got a job working for... Okay, no, it's not there. We took it up. Anyway, he got a job working for Curtis Aircraft, and of course he was involved in aviation quite extensively. The parachute thing was always at the back of his mind. And in 1919, he uh, <coughs> filed for a patent on a parachute uh, design, and uh, that went nowhere, but he did get it. So uh, he was then uh, getting into a point where he got into uh, all sorts of things besides. In his late teens, he was doing stunt diving and circuses in LA. He dived from 70 feet into a net, uh, became known as High, High Fly Irvin, which was uh, kind of an interesting thing. Very popular at air shows. Uh, he would do his dive thing, then he would uh, do shoot and jumps from balloons as well. He got into the act with that. Uh, so he was a very adventurous young man indeed. Uh, by the early 19. 1920, uh, the Army Air Corps had realized that, that this loss of pilots was kind of expensive in training these people, and then anything went wrong with the aircraft, uh, they died with it, which was not a good thing at all, because even crash landings in those days were not that great either. So what happened was the uh, Air Force formed a, a group down in Cook Field on the East Coast, uh, just south of Buffalo, that they uh, would uh, investigate the use of parachutes, free-falling type chutes. So by this time, Irvine had, uh, got a, had applied for his patent and got one on his uh, chute. He uh, wanted it tested, and uh, of course, in those days, uh, most aircraft were single-seaters, so he didn't get up in the air with it at all. But he did uh, uh, proceed with dummies, and he, they were quite successful. So. After his patent was filed, he was contacted by a major, if I get the name correct here. I made all these sort of copious notes and I haven't bothered reading them. <laughs> My writing improved dramatically as I finished them. So, uh, yeah, the Major Hoffman, down at the Cook Field, and he'd been appointed by the Army to uh, build an approach, uh, a, a research team. And he was asked to join the group, which was quite a major step forward. When he did, he met up with another guy, a guy called Floyd Smith. And he'd been following a similar course and path of career that uh, he had done, and uh, a friend of uh, Irvin had done, a lot of balloon jumps and so on, and very intrigued by this operation. So the pair of them got together, and they produced their first parachute, the, the Type A. and it. Uh, Irvine's first one had been designed with a 30-foot canopy, uh, whereas this one now went down to 26, and it had 40 separate panels on it. Uh, Irvine, on his chute that he'd made and tested with dummies, uh, had the slightly bigger hole, and of course his first one, he was not a seamstress by any means, so he approached a millinery company, and they produced the suit for him, made of silk, so as they all were in those days, so that's a very strong material. It was kind of fancy dress for the, the ladies, but uh, it was uh, very essential for shoots and great strength to it. So the uh, Smith was piloting a, a, a DH-9, a de Havilland aircraft, and uh, it up went uh, 
if I'm wearing two shoes, one in front me, and one on the back, and they went up to 1,500 feet flying at 100 mile an hour over the actual airfield. And a lot of people on the ground weren't too happy, but they felt something because of the gentleman to his death. Not so, I went and everything worked just as it was supposed to do and had done with all the dummies. And down he came, and he was so happy that it all worked perfectly. He didn't pay too much attention on his landing, so he broke his ankle. So he finished up in hospital. While he was still in the hospital, uh, the uh, Army Air Corps at that time ordered to uh, give him an order for 300 parachutes. Well, that was uh, a bit of a shock to him because they hadn't quite expected that. And of course, there was no way he could do that on his own. So that meant he had to form a parachute company, which is what he did, called the Irvin Shoot Company. And uh, when the, it was applied for, to get the license for the company name, somebody put a G on the end of it by mistake. And when he saw the proof thing, thing came through, I tried to get it corrected, but he didn't have enough money to change it and drop the G. So it stayed as the Irvine Company for quite some time. Uh, anyway, it, uh, it went steadily on from there. So uh, that was the start of him getting into business. Now, back in 1920, going back a little bit here again, uh, there was a company called the GA, sorry, JAHN Shoot Company. And they were testing a shoot at the field as well. And the, the test failed, uh, but the, uh, the guy survived because he was wearing an Irvin shoot as a backup, uh, <laughs> which was rather a flattering thing for uh, uh, him and lucky for him as well. He'd been testing, he was going to test with uh, five shoots, they all tangled up in each other, and he'd been loath to use the Irvin shoot, but it was the Irvin shoot that saved his life. So, uh, anyway, uh, the first uh, surviving uh, live parachutist, the first member of the Caterpillar Club, was a guy called Lieutenant Harold Harris. He retired from the Air Force in 1945 as a, a Brigadier General, so uh, he started back off being number one. <coughs> and uh, that was on the 20th of October 1922. Uh, <coughs> what they did, he got done all right after the malfunction of the aircraft and uh, survived the jump without any troubles whatsoever. Uh, they got pictures of the wreckage, the pictures of him with his parachute, and they put it, the parachute section made a little wall with all of this memorabilia on it from this first jump, of having saved his life. It wasn't called up at the uh, Caterpillar Club at that point in time. So uh, anyway, they suddenly realized if people are going to keep jumping from airplanes, they're going to need a bigger room, they're going to need a whole hall to get all these bits and so forth souvenirs of shoots and photographs and so on. So that they kicked around the idea of forming a club. That sounded like a good idea. And uh, they thought about names for the club. Uh, they had Sky Hookers, that was with a K. <laughs> Somebody's thinking of uh, Hooters. <laughs> uh, crawlers, they had all sorts of names that nothing really clicked. Uh, one of the, there were two members of the press there that had sort of come up with this thing, this idea, uh, Morris Hutton and Vernon Timmerman. Uh, these were, he was a photographer, and so th th this was their idea. They were kicking it around. One of their other buddies was thumbing through a catalog from the Caterpillar co uh, Tractor Company, and they, suddenly the name it rang a bell with them because a caterpillar is a silkworm that hangs by a silk thread as it comes down from the nest to the ground. So that was a, immediately approved by everybody and officially, and so it became the Caterpillar Club. That's how the name came into being. He approached the jeweler up in Buffalo and he produced the caterpillar that you saw up on the screen there with the two red ruby eyes and you have your name engraved on the back of it, which is what I've got in mind there, but I could flip it over it didn't balance right to uh, get the thing with the name on it. Anyway, that was the first uh, caterpillar member and from then on uh, Irvine made a promise that he would supply everybody who jumped with one of these gold caterpillars and the car and he'd keep a record of it. Well. Uh, he didn't know what he was getting into because they almost <laughs> broke the company with the, uh, the price of gold, especially in the up to World War II. Instead, in the early days, it cost about two bucks. By World War II, they were about six bucks. And so, almost what they are now, I think they use a, a, a much larger gold than the one that I've got mine. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the uh, second jump was a, a Lieutenant Frank Tyndall. 
In this case, the wings tore off the aircraft, and uh, out he went and got away with it, and he became the set number two. Why, obviously, with the airplane breaking up all over the place, it was going to be a pretty big club in next to no time. <laughs> so by the, let me see, by the end of 1925, there were 27 members in the club. All Americans, of course, because they hadn't really gone overseas yet. Uh, by the end of the, the 1920s, he was operating, operating out of 12, 11 countries worldwide, building urban type parachutes. The company's still in being today, especially in Britain, and they've, they've gone way beyond making parachutes. They're doing all sorts of other neat stuff as well. Uh, safety harnesses and cars, seat belts, the whole bit. So they really branched out. But, uh, his sole aim in those days was parachutes. By <clears throat> the RAF, of course, were, became very interested in this because the, they were still used, not using parachutes at all. So uh, he came over to England and they were using them in the RAF, but the British government insisted that he make a uh, operate as a company in Britain, as a registered British company. So he did that, becoming the urban shoot company in Great Britain, and they're still operating even today in the same place at Letchworth, which is about 35 miles north of London in Hertfordshire. So uh, that was the start of it. And the first RAF member was a pilot officer, Eric Pentland, who was uh, at the Five Flying Training School at Chester. If you've ever been to Chester, it's a rather nice old city with a lot of Elizabethan style homes there. Anyway, he was doing practice roles. He only had about six or seven hours. He did it on solo uh, in an average shooter aircraft. So uh, he, he, he going up solo to practice half barrel roles. And he was doing quite well with this. And then uh, they got out of control of him. The uh, wing fluttered, uh, got into it, and uh, he had to bail out. And he got away with it. Uh, Unfortunately, he was pretty low when he did get out, get out at about 500 feet. So that was all well and good, and out he went, and it worked. So he was the first uh, caterpillar in England. Uh, by the end of 1929, there were 56 members in the British section there. That included some people in Europe. There's a couple of Polish guys, a couple of Germans, and uh, a few French, all using the urban type shoot, which was the criteria for it. Uh, there was one which was a rather interesting one. It was a test pilot, flight lieutenant Pope. And he was a rather a big guy. He was about six foot six. He was about 30 years old. He'd been flying in World War II, uh, sorry, in World War I, uh, with, with quite a few decorations to him. And he was testing an aircraft called the Pipit, P I P I T, <laughs> which was a biplane uh, powered by a Rolls Royce Kestrel engine. And of course, that was the engine that became the forerunner to the Rolls Royce Merlin later on in the 30s. Uh, anyway, the, uh, he was about 220 pounds. That's a pretty big guy. So he had a tail problem with the aircraft, and he wasn't too happy with this, so he brought it back into land. He was getting a lot of flutter from it at the back end. So he brought it down and uh, mentioned it to the designer who was there, and also the sworn leader, Noakes, who was the uh, officer in charge of the, the unit. So Noakes decided he'd take it up and check it out himself. So. Uh, up he went, and, uh, he got up to about 800 feet. He was having trouble because they could see on the ground that the tail was beginning to, the rudder was beginning to flutter quite a bit. So uh, part of it fell off, so instead of jumping out, he had to shoot. He decided to try and bring it in, as most pilots, uh, test pilots, trying to do to try to bring it back and see if they can figure out what was wrong. In this case, it didn't work out too well, so uh, he was coming in quite okay, but then the thing just dived into the ground. He wasn't killed, but he was badly beat up. So two months later, they got another one to go and test it. And Pope, or Poppy, Poppy as they, they call him, it's one thing in the RAF, if you have a non-wall name, uh, they'll make a, a sort of a slangy one with it. So he was known as Poppy. Um, if you had a name like Woods, you became Timber Woods, uh, Chalky White, uh, Pissy Peacock. And, uh, the one, my favorite one, I got Doc Savage, and the one I flew with was Frosty Winterbottom. So, <laughs> uh, I flew with Frosty during the Berlin airlift, and he was, I could do a whole lecture on just from the escapades he used to get into. He fought in the Spanish Civil War uh, <laughs> on the losing side, unfortunately, never did get paid. I uh, finished up in uh, flying in the uh, Sunderland flying boats during World War II, and then finished up in Transport Command, which is where I met up with him. Anyway, uh, 
<laughs> coming back to old Poppy, uh, he took the thing up again, got up to about 4,000 feet, and the whole damn tail fell off, uh, <laughs> which uh, was not a good thing. So he got out of it without any trouble at all, but uh, that was uh, brought him into the, the Caterpillar Club. So these are some of the guys that uh, in the RAF that uh, had to jump for various reasons. Uh, I'm going on a bit here. So uh, one guy I want to show you here. As I mentioned, uh, this, is, oh, this is a free fall. Uh, the speed didn't fall. You do it about a 120 mile an hour. Then when you shoot off, it dropped to about, 100, about uh, 10 to 12 miles an hour, depending on your weight and physical shape and so on. Uh, if you would not shoot, then it's much more pleasant coming down. You've got time to view the scenery, provided you're high enough up. Uh, this gives you some idea of what it's like when you're in the chute with the airflow going up through it, and as you're tumbling, all that air turbulence is going on around you. This is an I took from a Navy uh, thing. They have, and American chutes, as I mentioned, are quite different. They've got your two shoulders, sorry, you've got your two shoulders, ooh, ooh, <laughs> this thing goes fast. You've got your shoulder straps up here, and then you have your leg straps down here. And in this one, you've released these, and that takes more, quite a few seconds to do it. They're splitting clips. So you have to undo two at the top and two at the bottom. And this is a case where you still want to keep yourself in the harness before you hit the water. And you don't, one of the things is when you're bailing out over water, you have no idea how tight when you're getting down to it. And if you jump, let go of that chute, so you don't want to drown with a chute dragging into the water and it fills up the water. Uh, you want to wait till your feet hit the water because it, if you drop from about 200 feet and you don't know how high you are, it's like landing on concrete. You're going to die. So that was that, how that one came into being there. This is what I want to mention here Bud Kingsbury. He was a member of our uh, group, uh, the B-17 group. And Bud was flying as a co-pilot in a B-17. came from Chicago. Spent most of his life swimming in Lake Michigan, uh, where in the summertime you have to still break the ice. It's pretty damn cold there, so he was used to cold water. He'd been on the raid in Foggio, which was an Italian base at the time. We eventually captured Italy in uh, the 12th Air Force route, uh, the 12th Air Force route out of there later on. He was shot down as they left the coast, <coughs> landed in the water. Uh, he was, three of them got out. He was one of them. He was the only one who survived. He swam 22 miles. The last two were agony because they were over land. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't let that one slide by. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, he, he did swim 22 miles. It took him 32 hours. And I spoke, that to me was quite amazing. The temperature in the water when he was shot down was not too bad. It was like a warm bath to him after Michigan. But they, he made it to the shore. And as he got close to the shore, he could hear the surf breaking. So that's when he uh, got rid of his, parrot, his uh, harness and uh, made it the rest of the way without any trouble at all. He was pretty well pooped. He was met by two young Italian girls who helped him out of the water. And of course, they had to turn him over to the Italian police. And then they in turn turned them over to the Germans, who then shipped them off. He eventually finished off at Stalag III. Uh, and he was there for quite a while. He was one of the guys that had to leave uh, and walk back. They walked about 50 to 100 miles in the winter time when the Russians were approaching. And Stalag III was east of uh, Berlin, about 60 miles east. So uh, he made it back, and forever after, he was plagued by frostbite on his feet. And that uh, speeded up his demise. He died about 10 years ago. Uh, anyway, what was interesting, uh, like most of us, we go out and talk to school kids and so on, and he was giving a lecture to the kids on what he'd done and telling them all about it. Uh, what was amusing, he mentioned at the time that that movie had come out, The Great Escape, which was a uh, film, and it was based on a true story in Stalag Three. but there were no Americans in The Great Escape. In the movie, they had Steve McQueen and Jim Garner and quite a few others, in, all in that particular film. So he was explaining this to the kids if they uh, ever see the movie, that's the great escape. And so one of the kids said, Do you ever meet Steve McQueen? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a kid. Yeah. <laughs> so much for education. Anyway, I asked them one day, I said, Do you ever think you wouldn't make it? It never crossed my mind because in the daytime, he could uh, see the mountains as he came up and down with the waves. 
And uh, he did see a couple of fins, but they had no idea what they were, but no sign of life or any other life at all. So it was a lonely uh, swag adder, and he was damn fit to be able to do that. I tried swimming to Catalina, or swimming the English Channel. Quite a remarkable feat. Anyway, unfortunately, uh, he passed on, as I say, about 10 years ago, but uh, he never thought he couldn't make it. At night time, you could see the Polaris star, so he could navigate that way. So he kept himself pretty well on the uh, right path to get to the shore. Quite a remarkable feat indeed. This is a Lancaster. The Lancaster, as I mentioned, was tough to get out of. The only the gunner at the, uh, at the back was okay to get out of there, and the door at the front. Uh, on takeoff, the bombardier was supposed to stay in the aircraft, but a lot of them didn't bother because to get to the seat, if you, what I'm trying to get, show you here is the actual harness set up. It's difficult to see in this picture. This is your shoulder strap coming down, and this is that curved thing right here, where that clip pops out of that, and that stays on the actual harness, so that bit comes out, and the whole thing goes upwards. <coughs> this just shows you uh, the pilot on the left, and the uh, engineer doing some of the stuff before he sits in his seat. This is the actual panel of the Lancaster. Uh, the only kind of one, the pilot, and the engineer sitting in this section. <coughs> and the bombardier of uh, bomb aimer is up front, down here on the floor. This shows you a better setup with the picture. The uh, engineer's seat here flips down. So it meant the navigator who sits behind the pilot here. <coughs> well, that's just the. Um, Getting ahead of myself here with the back of it here. Uh, behind the pilot, there's one piece of uh, armor plate. That's the only armor plate on the Lancaster. It's the only aircraft bomber that we had that had armor plate. In the Halifax, we didn't have that because he had an engineer there. He would take the bullet from the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> no choice. Anyway, as you can see, the layout is uh, kind of difficult to get off. <coughs> this is the engineer panel in the Halifax. This is the nose of the Halifax. Uh, you can see the bomb angle here has this beautifully cushioned pad to lie on. Uh, this is the actual control of the bomb site here. That's the actual site head there. This would be where my parachute was. Uh, I'm going to talk about my bailout here. This is where my parachute would be stacked. That's such a cover because this the aircraft is in a hangar up in Yorkshire. You can go and see it anytime you're up in England. <laughs> this again is the navigator panel in the for the two of us, Des sat on the left, I sat on the right. You can see our two uh, ports, uh, our two uh, uh, Dalton computers here. I wish to hell that I still had one of these because they're quite rare. This is the uh, this little one here. Uh, these are not laid out the way they should be, but the, this is, a, say, an aircraft in a static condition. That's the uh, fish pond. Uh, that's part of the H2S, which is this one here. That's a radar altimeter there. That was our blind navigational device. You could bomb with that, or that would give you uh, pictures of the ground. It's not uh, TV type pictures, but it shows you coastlines and you get bigger returns from cities. When the radar pulse hits the ground, uh, it bounces off, hits the building, and comes back. If you're over water, it hits the ground and bounces away. It doesn't come back, <laughs> so you get a blank spot on the screen. If we took the center of that thing here, we could get rid of that, and it becomes a a uh, warning device here, and that would look around 180, uh, 360 degrees around the aircraft, <coughs> up to about five degree angle above the horizontal. And this was usually set beside the wireless operator's position, and uh, <coughs> he could then see every aircraft in the area around us as a little blip. And if you saw one moving towards you, that was a fighter, you could start the course crew maneuver. Uh, on the left up here was the G box, that was actually in my position, that these were reversed. Uh, that's where you could take your fixes there. This was an air prediction indicator here with a distant reading compass. Uh, we have the normal uh, <coughs> liquid compass in the aircraft as they did in the Lank. It's the same setup in the Lancaster. in the Lancaster in the nav position there. Uh, there's a, one of these uh, compass readouts in the bomb site uh, computer. One here, one in front of the pilot. And of course, the compass is done at the back end of the aircraft and it's gyro stabilized. So you get a very good reading and very accurate. So when you bank and move her around, you get compass swirl and magnetic compass, not with these, it's a tick, tick, tick all the way around. 
it's kind of a neat trick because uh, rather than give the pilot a course, I was only going to change it about three or four degrees. I could adjust it here, just set it off, and he'd think, oh, I'm not concentrating, I'm moving here. And he'd correct it, not like I've given him a correction. So at the end of the trip, I could say, look, that was a good course. We got right on the nail without having to change anything. So I just look a bit gullible at times. <laughs> uh, that again was the uh, G box. And this was the another end section of that. This is looking back, and this is a better shot here. This is looking towards the back end of the aircraft, and you can see the our seat here is stored for the two pair of us, uh, Des and myself, sat side by side. So that's up out of the way, and on the floor underneath that is the escape hatch. So we were out and we were gone. Uh, and this one here, there's two steps up, that brings me to the top of the bomb bay, and that runs all the way to the back end, which is going, just passing the pilot section here. Uh, so I think this next shot's a bit better. Yeah, <clears throat> it gives you a better section looking towards the front. You can see this aircraft's inside a hangar. Uh, these are the uh, throttles there, that's the rev counters there, and the compass is down on the left hand side just about here. Uh, <clears throat> various knobs and buttons and flaps and so on, they're all there. Coming, going further back now. This is the engineer's panel, it's right behind the pilot. The reason I put this one in, you can see the uh, uh, sextant hanging from the astrodome there. When I had to go up there and take a fix, I had to push him out of the way. Uh, but I could do that. And there's a, I think I got a better shot of it here now than that. This is looking towards the back end from that position by the engineer's panel. And that's right at the end of the top of the bomb bay. There's normally a, a, a panel here with a padding on it. Uh, if somebody got injured, you could lay them on it. So you have two main spars to go over to get down to the back end. This black mass here is the mid-upper turret. So to get past that, you've got a, about a foot on either side, maybe a little bit more, to get down to the back end of the aircraft. And this is uh, in the roof just before uh, we have uh, escape hatches on the top of the aircraft. You can get out that way if you ditch or crash land it. And this is the tail turret. And this, uh, this is a built and pole turret. Instead of having the hangars like we have in the uh, B-24 in the hangar uh, outside here, it's a single control. It works rather like a pilot setup, left and right, fore and aft. And as you rotate it left and right with your wrist, the turret will swing left and right. So the reason I brought all that stuff in is so this is where I landed in France. So I'll just do a little talk on what I did in my jump, because we're going to run out of time otherwise. Uh, but in the RAF, when you uh, go through the becoming a bomber crew, you're usually training on an aircraft uh, like this one here, which was a Quitley. It was a very early World War II bomber, didn't carry that much. Or you trained on the Wellington, which was sort of a pretty well modern bomber, made of uh, uh, aluminum uh, geodetic construction and covered in cloth. It was known as a cloth bomber. Uh, on these two here were in the operational training units, and they were pretty well worn out aircraft, but they were good enough for training purposes. So, this is where you became a crew. In the RAF, it was a little bit different. They put 20 pilots, 20 navigators, 20 bombers, 20 wireless operators, and 40 gunners into a, a hangar. And you've got two weeks to make yourself into a crew. Nobody knows anybody from that. You know, looking at each other. You may see the other guy coming up on the train when you met in the, the bar when you got to the officer's mess or the sergeant's mess or whatever. And uh, you've got two weeks to get it all organized up, otherwise they'll detail you off. So uh, it became uh, getting crewed up it was uh, kind of a novelty, and uh, I finished up. Three of us were commissioned, which was quite unusual. Our pilot was commissioned, uh, Des was commissioned, and I was commissioned. Oddly enough, I was a senior uh, rank uh, by about two months, I think. So <laughs> and you really pissed old Des off, but that was the way it was. I just locked out, luck of the draw. Anyway, we finished up there, then we went to what we call a heavy conversion unit, and that's where we learned to fly uh, in the four-engine job here, the Halifax. Now, this is the later model, the earlier ones had a diamond-shaped tail, and they were a bit of a death trap because they were underpowered, they didn't have the Hercules radial engines, they had an a, a inline Merlin engine, but the aircraft was designed for mid-mounted engines, and the other, the Merlin engine was hung under the wing, and so it was not a, a very good combination. In the diamond-shaped tail, if you went into a corkscrew, you could get rudder-stalled aircraft or crash into the ground. 
Uh, so they modified it and it became a gambling airplane. Uh, on this occasion, your final uh, checkout right before you went to the squadron to begin operations, uh, you went on what they call a spoof raid. And we had spoof raids going on every night over Germany. And these were raids where uh, you send out about 18, maybe 100 aircraft from the various uh, heavy conversion units uh, to crews to get you used to flying in, uh, in the dark along with a lot of other airplanes all going in a sort of mini bomber stream. Because the bomber streams could be normally about nine miles long, three miles wide, and about a mile deep. You all the aircraft going in the same direction. So this gives you that sort of feeling. And instead of going uh, directly to a drop bomb, you dropped a window, which is now known as chaff. And that's rather like the tinsel you see in the Christmas trees. And that was designed, it's cut to half the wavelength of the uh, uh, radar that's going to jam. You'd have mandrel screens. These were V-17 aircraft that the RAF operated. And they would jam specific German radars. They could sweep band every frequency, or they could jam certain areas completely. It was that highly directional of what they could do with the V-17. I'll do a talk on that sometime again in the future. I've done it in the past, but that's what we were doing that night. So we were briefed, as you, just as if you're going on a major operation. Everybody reports to your various sections to get the target information for the night and where you were going to be heading time to take off at longer route points the whole bit. Uh, so <clears throat> we went out to our aircraft and as I left my uh, concert hut, one of the guys there was playing his, with his accordion, he starts playing the Dead Man's March, which <laughs> was quite inspiring. Little did I know. It was going to prove quite a prophetic uh, a little tune that night. So off we went, we got out to the aircraft, started up. Uh, one of the engines refused to start, which was not unusual as an engine. These were all airplanes. So uh, we scampered over to a, 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 they had a standby for us, so we got into that one with all our gear. Our tail gunner uh, was going to put that one on surface because the turret doors and the tail turret are about that wide. There's two of them. So one goes that way and the other goes that way. So that leaves them with a hole about yay big. And one of them was a bit sticky, but it had one with. <laughs> had to abort one end, one aircraft, we got another abort this one, otherwise we're going to loop that. So anyway, we got it started up on time, we taxied out, and as we were turning onto the runway, we got a green for the caravan, and they brought radio silence to mention the fact that there were German intruders in the area, so it meant that uh, you could get shot down over your own country if you were not careful. So uh, we took off as scheduled, and went off there climbing into the black of night, and, and you want to know how black was it? Well, it was about as black as a Zulu warrior's armpit. It was pretty dark. <laughs> so, we did a radius of action climb up, took a uh, set course over base, uh, right on schedule, and then off we went. And uh, various points in England, if you're familiar with it, uh, there's Beachy Head, which is right on, down on Sussex coast. It's a very prominent piece of land sticks out into the Eng English Channel. And then when the raids were going out to certain areas in uh, Germany, southern Germany, you go out that one. If you're going uh, to uh, the Ruhr or to uh, Berlin or Hamburg or whatever, you go up by Flamborough Head, which was a, another very prominent thing up by uh, uh, Yorkshire, and you'd head out. That would be a rendezvous point, point anyway. So we were heading for uh, Beachy Head, and that one uh, is easy to find because it stood like, like a dog's ball with my radar set. So if you look at Fido when you get home, you can get the idea of that uh, similar. Anyway, we got there on time, hung a left, and we were off across the channel. Well, this time we were at operational height of 18,000 feet. Everything's pre-timed. At a certain point in time, the engineer went down the back, and he started shoveling out the window, which comes in packets about a year long, weigh about a couple of pounds, and you just pop them down through the flare chute, and these flutter out, and that would be set up to be picked up with the German radar. So the aim was to create a diversion for the main force, which was going in to bomb targets up in the Ruhr. So we were heading pointing towards southern Germany. Uh, we just went over to the German border, or, <coughs> which was the point where we stopped uh, dropping window. We had to descend from 18,000 feet down to 5,000 and turn around and head for home. So our part of the operation was done for the night. So as we came down uh, to 5,000 feet, I took a fix on the G-box. And uh, it was at 3.28 in the morning. So uh, I put it all down, took the coordinates, gave them to Des to plot on the chart, and uh, I happened to glance at the altimeter in the cabin, and it was reading 3,500 feet. So I, I got on the radio to 
Yet, by well, this time, we'd, I'd, uh, we're below oxygen height at 10,000 feet. You could take your mask off. So I got on the, the horn and said, hey, Jeff, we're 3,500 feet. Uh, but some hills around here. Now, I'm not talking big bear, but uh, there's five, six hundred, eight hundred 600, 800 feet. If you hit one, it's sort of academic. Well, I did. <laughs> so uh, that's when he, he said, well, all the engines have stopped. Now, nothing catches your attention more than a little statement like that. <laughs> We've been throttled back. We've been descending through clouds, and I, I hadn't noticed it at all because there was hardly any noise with it. So that's when he said, you better bail out, look. So I, I okay, that's all. I pulled the blackout curtain as I shot into the nose like a little wooden bear, picked up my parachute, clipped it on, came back through the, the blackout curtain, and there's old Des with his shoot on, straining like my both hands on the damn handle on the door, uh, and uh, the door hinged forward, so I couldn't help him pull it on, because the, uh, I'd been standing on the door to do that, so I could see he was not getting anywhere, and I, I don't know why it wouldn't open up, so I looked at his hand, I said, Jeff, looks like we're going out the back, so he turned around and zoomed off, I didn't see him until the next day. So <laughs> I followed him, and I, uh, as I stepped up the two steps, uh, to get to the top of the bombway there, I could see the wireless operator getting out. He was clipping on his shoe because uh, it was right beside him, and so he was going to be following me. And I had time to glance at the panel, and there was all the uh, dials are pushing all over the place, and uh, uh, the uh, I could hear the engine room and then dying off again. So whatever it was, I had no idea. So anyway, uh, I got down to the back, halfway back, and there's the engineer sitting there, and the uh, control. Tra control transfer levers for the fuel tanks were all back there, so obviously we had some fuel problem at least. So I, I didn't, he wasn't on the intercom, so I lifted his helmet and said, you got to jump, so he nodded. By this time, the wireless offer was kicking my butt, so uh, <laughs> on the bomb day, yeah, there's two steps at the front, it's only one at the back, and I'm not a big guy, so I had no night vision, I fell off that thing. Fortunately, I kept my balance, I get down to the back end there, and uh, there's the Talked to uh, mid upper gunner Jimmy, opening the door, the hatch on the left hand side of the aircraft. So he got down, and I saw him, and he sure I gave him a good push, and I said, I'm out I went. <laughs> so uh, there's no counting to 10 or anything. Uh, I saw the tail wheel go by, so I had my hand on the ripcord, pulled that, and uh, I could hear the uh, foot against the shark lines came up. And it only takes about two seconds for that to happen. I'd been falling backwards head first, I guess, but I got the impression I went that way. My boots flew off. And I managed to keep the left one on, but the other one disappeared. Oddly enough, my gunner found it in the forest the next day, so I got it back. <laughs> Which was a truly no one shot. Anyway, I could feel myself swaying. I was in the car, um, and uh, I got that sorted up. And it's incredibly quiet after the noise of the aircraft. It's unbelievably quiet. And how quiet you may ask? Well, it was quiet enough to hear a sparrow fire. It was that quiet. <laughs> anyway, I got straightened out, and before I knew it, it was in a tree. Uh, I, I don't know how long it was in the air, but it was not a long time at all. And then I did the dumbest thing ever I, I've done in my life. I turned the buckle, whacked it, and I fell out of the harness. Now, something really I caught, it could be high up. I, I could barely see the ground, but barely. And I only fell about seven feet. I, it was high enough that I couldn't reach the damn thing to pull my chute down. So that was me down on the ground. When I still had my helmet, which was kind of dumb, really. Because normally, any time I move around, I'd pop the interlead cord into my pocket. And, and that, that way, it didn't catch on anything. So anyway, I had that there. So I'm sitting there and sort of drizzling a bit, and the parachute acting like a little tent above me. So I had to wait till it got light and find out where the heck I was. I knew my exact latitude and longitude, but I had no idea what the hell that was on the ground. So, all night long I'd have traffic moving, so I was fairly close to a road, but in the forest you can't tell where the sound's coming from, it's very deceptive. So come the, the dawn, um, the rain had stopped, which was kind of pleasant, so I put my foot in the helmet, so I, off I went walking this way. Now, I was going downhill uh, in the forest, I came across a little path, and eventually I came out of the forest completely, and there's a long sloping uh, grass and a, a road at the bottom of it. And oddly enough, uh, I we want it. Yeah. Oops. Um. here we are here. 
this is Sandizi, it's where I landed. And this is the area here, and that's the sort of forest that I landed in because there's a road running along here. I can, I, can, I, can, I can blow this up if idea. you go to the so, end. It gives you some idea of where I was. So, uh, there it is. Yeah. 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 Oh, right. Well, yeah. So, fortunately, I didn't land here, <coughs> and the drink would have been a bit embarrassing. This is the forest where I came down. I had no idea which of these forests I was in, but that was the road that I could hear the traffic on. So, there were some. Uh, um, it slowed down in one jeep on the highway, so I had my little dinghy whistle, and I'm blowing this thing like crazy. I still got my main west on, and I'm running as fast as I could, <laughs> waving furiously, and the jeep stopped. And my luck was not with me that night, because in the jeep were two French soldiers. <laughs> my God, what have we got here? My mastery of the French tongue is barely good enough to get my face slapped. <laughs> made the point that I wanted to see some military police. So they didn't know what the hell they got. But this was in Patton's Third Army group, and all uh, Georgia had swept through there only about a couple of weeks before, so they didn't know what they'd got. So anyway, uh, I climbed into the Jeep, and I thought, we're going to shoot, but they're going to have to clean it up. So <laughs> instead of the military the police, they took me into the local uh, police station, a couple of jean, uh, six gendarmes, all those cops I have ever seen. <laughs> Mike and you look like a midget beside them. <laughs> they marched me down the main street, three on either side. Windows were going up, people pointing, kids were running around. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell I was saying. So they took me into a, a, a military post, and there was a sergeant sitting at the desk there. And I said, uh, can I see it? Uh, and then the intelligence officer, I want to let him know what the hell went wrong. I want to know what happened to my aircraft. Because I'd sat under the tree expecting to hear a bloody great bang because I knew we had plenty of fuel, and then when nothing happened, I thought, well, they must have kept the damn thing in the air somehow. And so mm -hmm. and I began to wonder, did I hear somebody else has ordered a jump or whatever? <laughs> so I tried to reason it all out. I had nothing else to do until it got light. So anyway, uh, uh, the, the side said, OK. And I said, by the way, can I get a pair of boots? I've only got one boot here. And he said, sure, what size? So I, I said, seven. He said, get the lieutenant a pair of boots, he yelled. I got a brand new pair of boots. Now, Patton's Army must have been the most organized thing I have ever met in my life. Uh, if I'd been trying to get a pair of boots in the RAF at that short notice, I would have needed an order signed by the king to get them that nice. <laughs> anyway, up came the pair of boots, I put them on. I, fortunately, I still hung on to my flying boot. So uh, <clears throat> I met up with the two intelligence officers, and they had a complete operational plan. If they got any air crew at all, they had a format as to what they'd follow. They would interrogate us, notify their headquarters, ship us on the next airplane up to Paris, just like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So I asked what, what happened. Uh, any plane crash? They said, we've got something about a crashed aircraft, um, and we've got four survivors, which I thought, well, I know Jimmy's one of them, but so who else got out? So it turned out uh, four got out. Uh, the other four were uh, Jimmy, the middle of the gunner, tail gunner, the widest operator, and all deaths. Uh, the tail gunner, unfortunately, had a bad experience because he was from Jamaica, uh, black as the ace of spades, a real neat guy. He was a medical student, as a matter of fact. And we put a lot of uh, blacks flying in the Air Force. And I was a bit worried about that because he turned out to be the one that was badly injured. And uh, what had happened, uh, when he tried to get out, got the order to jump, one of the doors jammed. So instead of having a gap this big, he had a gap about that big. And his chute was inside the aircraft like it was in the Lancaster. So to get out, he had to get out through that panel, that opening gap. And in the process, he bent one of the hooks that caught, and it bent it completely. So when he clipped on his parachute, it undid. So he clipped it on again, held it there, and when it went out, uh, it undid, and the buckle came around and smashed his whole face in. So he came down hanging from one chute, by one strike, my God. And when he landed, they hit the trees and put up quite a few ribs as well. So he was in bad shape. I never did find out about this until after the war when he came back to, to see us on the squadron. Instead of uh, teeth, he had metal bars. You could see the screws that went in because we didn't have the uh, uh, technology for the dentistry that we have now. But eventually, I presume he would get uh, fixed up properly. And that's when we find out what the hell had happened to him. So the end came, the other three came in, and there was Jimmy with my flying boots up. Oh, that's 
So I got it back, so I've, I've got a picture of me in the actual boots. So that was last. Nice. Uh, they, uh, I had lunch with the two intelligence guys. Uh, uh, they were living in a, a sort of a, a commandeered a house. Uh, the guy had been a, a chef, and they, they were eating with the American food ration. I've never eaten food like that in my life. <laughs> we had done pretty damn well. So they flew us up. The, they flew us up to Paris in a um, C-47. We just sat down in the back, and off we went with this crew. Then we were met up in Paris by an RAF guy, and they split us up. The two officers went to one uh, hotel, and the other two went to a different one, which I couldn't quite see the need for that. So we had a night in Paris. The next day we were flown back to England, and then got back to uh, our squadron base. And the, uh, Jeff didn't know we were alive till I walked into the bar and said, you owe me a damn beer, guys. So <laughs> <laughs> then I found out what had happened. Well, we weren't quite sure. Uh, they put it down to carburetor icing on the uh, coming down through cloud with the engines throttled back. It was either going to be that or the Haller put the aircraft engines on a bomb, an empty tank or something. They never did find out. I tend to think it was carburetor icing because the uh, temperature at that time of year in March was not that great. So that was our uh, entry into the caliper of the club. So it, compared to some of the ones that I, I can talk on, but we're running out of time, unfortunately. Uh, one of the more impressive ones was this aircraft here, the Glenn, crew of three, a pilot, a navigator who did the bombing, and a gunner on the top here. And they were on a, a radar and building stuff in the early days of the war, but badly shot up, and uh, they crashed in Germany. Uh, they were 8,000 feet when he got the order to jump, but the gunner never got the order, he never heard the order for some reason or other. Uh, anyway, uh, the Pilot and navigator jumped, they got out by landing in trouble. The aircraft was in a flat spin going down. And at 6,000 feet, he had an altimeter to down by his end anyway. And you could see it going down and down, and at 1,000 feet, he's saying, Are we going to jump or are you going to? <laughs> and there's still no reply, so he crawled up to the front. And the, that aircraft, I've flown in it quite a bit. Um, there's only about this much room between the top of the bomb bay and the roof of the aircraft. And he crawled up and found that both seats were empty. So I thought, a clue here or something. So straps on his parachute. By this time, he could see out of the hatch. The ground was really that close. And he thought, well, it's better. I'd better get out anyway and, and try it. And the party went at 50 feet. He pulled the car, and the, street, the chute streamed, but it didn't fully open. But the aircraft did, exploded, and the hot air blew him back up in the air and blew him sideways, so down he came. And I had done a field about 100 feet from the wreckage. He was the first one done. The other two were still there. <laughs> I could do one quick one here. And this one here is the Hamden. That was a very uh, primitive bomber. The width of that aircraft, so if the pilot did that, where his elbows were with the width of the cock. It was a very tiny one. It's known as a flying suitcase. It sent three of them to Bob Willems happen. This was in the uh, early 1940s. And these aircraft, Bomber Command at the start of war had 200 aircraft front line. And the Wellington was the most modern. The others were these two here, and this tiny one here. Uh, anyway, what happened with this one, we were supposed to drop mines on the Tirpitz in the uh, Wellington Southern Harbor. Uh, they sent three of them out. It was supposed to be a, a high altitude raid that would coincide to draw the flight up to them, but they snuck in at 50 feet to lay their mines. And mining in the air, RAF was quite a common thing. Our squadron did a lot of it. Uh, the mines were the property of the Navy, and they would have a naval officer there to do all this, the few settings and so shooting and so on. As a result of that, uh, they were coming in at 50 feet, and of course the other raid had come and gone, so they got all the flak at that. And 50 feet doesn't leave you an awful lot of a room for maneuvering, and they, they were taking all the flak from all three aircraft from Natalie. And this was no better than the others. He managed to, uh, the aircraft was on fire, he passed <coughs> on to drop his uh, mine, which he did at 50 feet. He slowed the aircraft down, throttled back, and he wanted the mine to make sure it didn't skip bomb or break apart if you're going too fast. He, he got it off in time, and of course the, the structure of the ship was coming up, so he poured on the power, went over the other side, trying to get down in the water. Still on fire, by this time the aircraft was going nowhere. And he decided he'd better get out because he looked back, the whole back end of the aircraft was 
in the flames, so there's no hope for the crew there. He stepped up onto the wing and he just felt the aircraft beginning to get ready to stall. And he pulled his parachute and it sucked him off the wing. And as the chute swung on a pendulum in effect, he came down and hit the deck. So he, he was a member of the Caterpillar Club, he didn't get it for six years because he had six years in the back. At least for that, the next thing he heard was the sound of German footsteps coming down and he was a POW. But he did, they had him in a cell for a little while, he did hear his mind go off, so at least he got to the target. So these are some of the types of... <laughs> Most of the names I've mentioned in the uh, famous jumps that have came along over the years, but uh, some rather high celebrities have fallen into the category of uh, bailing out just to save their lives. And, and the most famous one, of course, was the uh, Charles Lindbergh. He had four jumps. That's four times the uh, aircraft failed to uh, live up to the expectation of, expectations of the, the designers. However, uh, he was one. The RAF had one guy actually jump five times, a uh, fighter pilot in the Battle of Britain flying uh, mainly over France during the Battle of France and then later in the Battle of Britain and he was on his sixth jump when he didn't make it. He always brought his parachute back and had it repacked, which is kind of unusual, but he had great faith in it. But on his final one, uh, it was about 300 feet when he got out and it was just too late and it didn't deploy in time. Uh, it sounds as if he couldn't have been very much of a fighter pilot for having only uh, uh, had to jump five, or short down five times, which is not a good thing, but actually had close to eight or nine kills and two or three probables as well, so he didn't do too badly. Uh, I don't know the details of all of his jumps. Anyway, that's uh, one that was uh, <coughs> in that uh, dubious record of uh, five plus almost six. Uh, another famous one was Jimmy Doodlin. He had three of them jump. Uh, jumps. Uh, that was in the 1929 to 1931, all within the space of two years. That's quite remarkable. And again, mainly the aircraft in the 30s uh, were not too reliable and a lot of mechanical failures uh, causing the pilot to have to get out in a hurry. And the final, most famous one, of course, was uh, General, sorry, uh, <coughs> President H. W. Bush. Uh, he had to jump once. He landed in the Pacific Ocean, it was in a rubber dinghy. So he's also in the uh, uh, Goldfish Club, which has one of the qualifications to get into the Goldfish Club. You have to be uh, either ditched in the ocean or uh, bailed out and landed in the water and had your own dinghy uh, to sit until you got rescued. And he was, he was picked up by a submarine. So uh, these are three of the more famous names that uh, are adorn the Caterpillar Club uh, halls of fame. No, no. Just the final thing. Uh, there's, we've got a couple of books here which are in the library on the parachute side. There's an excellent one called Into the Soup by a guy called Ian Mackersley. It's full of stories like the ones I just told you there uh, on various escapes. Mainly because uh, in England they had everybody available. In America, I don't think any was ever done in that manner with all the American escapees, uh, which is a great shame because like the one about Kingsbury, the one I told you about, an incredible escape. I loved, I was hoping that the, the two I've met here before, but I guess they didn't see it in the newspaper to come out and be able to talk to us about it. So, anyway, you've had enough of my chitter chatter here, so. Well, we haven't had enough, but <laughs> <laughs>